them and be able to talk a little bit about what God is doing there as well. Thank you. Well, it's great to be with you this morning and in your new facilities. Uh, you have a beautiful facility here. Last year it was in the makings, and here you are sitting inside of it. Amen. Well, I'll say sawadika. That's how we welcome everyone in Thailand. We don't handshake and we don't hug. We just sawadika. Good morning to everyone. It's wonderful to be back here again with you. Uh, we left Thailand March 31st. It was 39 Celsius when we left. And so we're getting closer to our return in June. And our Bible school is already up and running. And our Thai staff are doing that. And so it's wonderful to be with you here this morning. Some of my part in uh, when we're over in Thailand is I teach in the Bible school. And I also do the English, English uh, end of uh, the paperwork. And it's like all the receipts come in in Thai. So you kind of got to decipher them. And I have our Thai staff write on them in English what they are, and I'm thinking, no, I'm not sure really what that means, but I have to decipher it. And so I'm a, I have a very vital part over there with Marvin. I support him, and we work together, and God is good, and it's wonderful to be with you today. Yeah. Oh, so we've been together for 18 years, working together, and very seldom apart, so that's a miracle, isn't it, to be able to work with your spouse and Jim side by side? At home, at work, and rarely ever separated. And June 24th, we'll be married 37 years. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I shared in the first service that we had a, uh, a board meeting of Impacting Asia on Thursday, and we've invited Pastor Randy to come on our board. So we're looking forward to that, that he can impart into our, our lives and help us go to the next level. Even though I'm 57 years old, you know, I still have to keep growing. Amen. All right. You know, most of the time I read my way out of trouble. I have books over, I have a couple thousand of them in Thailand. And, you know, a lot of times I go back with probably about 75 a time. <laughs> That's a lot of books, right? But now I have a reader that uh, Pastor Rander gave me. Amen. Uh, and that, that's how I actually, I have not had a mentor over there. And when we were sent there, I was told by our leader that sent us there 18 years ago. He said he didn't want to hear from me unless I was actually going to pack my bags and come back to Canada. Then I could call him. But otherwise, solve the problems yourself. That's what I want. Amen. So that's what we've been working on. But we're thankful to have Pastor Randy coming on to help us to solve some things to go to a new level. Amen. <laughs> I was told that pretty clear, too. But anyhow. All right. Didn't want any phone calls. All right. Well, this morning, I'm going to share from the Word of God from Philippians 3.7. Philippi Boti Sam Kochet Kap. Mikon Tai, you may? You tini, me may or may me, may koi mitalai? Me may? Any Thai people here this morning? Yok Mulei! I don't see any. Said, lift up your hand. Shout out. None. Hey, you know what? That's what we need here. This is a, a multi church. We need some Thais in this church, some Laotians, Cambodians, and. Uh, uh, we have Filipinos here. Amen, Filipinos. Okay. Hey, man, we have anybody here from Jamaica, man? Amen, okay, amen. All right. All right. So the title of my sermon this morning is, I once thought these things were valuable. I once thought these things were valuable. And now I'll read... Uh, verse 7 of Philippians 3, it says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Because all that Christ has become to Paul, Paul is willing to collect all his former privileges described in verses 5 and 6 and put them in one parcel and write them off as a loss. And verse 5 says, I was... I was circumcised when I was eight days old, and I was also circumcised like that. We followed the Old Testament very closely in my family. But I'm not a blood Jew, but I'm an Abrahamic Jew. Amen. And he says, I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strict obedience to the Jewish law. Verse 6, I was so zealous that I harshly 
persecuted the church. As for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. And now Paul is treating these all as a liability. He's not saying, he's not, he's saying these are not assets, but these are liabilities. And now the contrast between profit and loss or valuable and worthless is a rabbinic one or one taught by the rabbis. And it underlines the teachings of Jesus. And it's in Matthew 16, 26. And it says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? And there is nothing worth more than your soul. There's nothing worth more than your children's soul. And nothing can grieve you more uh, that I know of than when your children aren't following after God. Right? It's important, you know, I, and I realize for me I got too busy doing things sometimes, but I'm able to rebuild relationships with my children because there's nothing more important than the mortal soul of a human. The tense of I now consider is a Greek per perfect denoting an action or a decision made in a past time which is effective in the present. So Paul made a decision in the past, but it's effective today now. Sometimes Christians make decisions in the past, but they're not effective now. And we need to, those decisions that we made in the past need to be effective all the way through our lifetime. Philippians 3.8 says, yes, everything else is worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. And the progression of Paul's thought is marked by strong particles of the Greek language. And it's ala man gun gika, you know, it almost sounds a little bit like Thai. Chai cup, amen, which is translated, what is more? Not only that, there's more. We are now prepared then by this forceful introduction of Paul for an important announcement by the Apostle Paul. What is that announcement? Paul's range of thought is now extended to include not only the religious advantages of the early verses, it includes everything which might conceivably reckon as meritous, and claimed as acceptable to God by a religious person. Whatever may be regarded as a prop to support the person who desires after something to boast about. I remember before I didn't know that I was proud, but it was important to me. I did everything I could. I wanted to have some value in life. And I went through and I got a trade and I became a heavy duty mechanic. And I was a heavy duty diesel mechanic in Alberta. And that was important to me. But that was a prop to me. My self-worth was based on that paper. Even though I was born again, that's what gave me self-worth. That's probably why God didn't put me in the ministry till I was 30. Because my self-worth was in the wrong place, right? I had my values wrong. When my values should be based on Christ alone, my values shouldn't have been on a piece of paper that said that I was a mechanic. It's not wrong to have self-esteem, but it's wrong that my entire value system is based on, on that or my self-worth. It's to the person who's blind to the fact that he or she can only live by the grace of God. Or the person who has a virtue which he or she would call their own. And I, I shared in the first service, you know, I was in the hospital and uh, I was very sick when I was 23 and the nurse that was looking after me was of a certain denomination that wasn't spirit-filled, not that that matters necessarily, because sometimes spirit-filled people can be mean too, right? And, uh, or is that true or not true? Uh, not, no, I wasn't saying in this church. I was talking in general. All right, not in this church, bless God. There's no mean spirit people here, amen? Amen. Anyhow, all right. And so she said to me, I've never been sick a day in my life. That was her virtue, right? As if somehow I should have talked to my intestines and said to intestines, intestines, you should never be sick. You know, anyhow, there's something I couldn't do anything about. But that was her virtue, and I mean, and it didn't help me any. So all is counted as a loss and worthless and garbage. 
Anything that takes away from Christ is worthless and garbage. Anything you own that gives you value apart from Christ is worthless and garbage. Like getting a new car. All of a sudden, your value soars. The neighbors come over to look at your new car. Your self-worth and self-esteem has skyrocketed with that new car. But not in Christ, that's not the case. In Christ, our value is in him, not in that vehicle. We, drove, we have a truck that has 640,000 kilometers on it, and uh, we got it in 1995, and uh, it's 22 years old now. But when I drove that truck, or Anna drove it, I guess I drove the motorcycle. But when she drove that truck, or, and now she has a 2012 Toyota 4x4. Amen. Has your self-worth skyrocketed? Maybe it has. Bless God, I don't know. But <laughs> it feels good. Amen. I feel good. All right. But our value doesn't change just because we're driving a brand new vehicle or an older one. Our value is in Jesus Christ. So if you're driving an old rust bucket, you probably aren't. Nobody in this parking lot, right? If you're driving an old car, your value is no less than somebody who's driving a Mercedes Benz. Oh, Lord, won't you give me a Mercedes Benz, right? Your value is exactly the same as somebody driving a Mercedes Benz if you're driving an old rusty old Ford or a Chev. Okay, did you know that? Your value hasn't changed. But when we got a new 4x4, our missionary neighbors came over to talk to us and look at our 4x4. Our value skyrocketed once we got that 4x4. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. I remember when we were in Grand Prairie, Alberta, when we bought a house. Before, we were just transient white trash from Ontario. But once we bought a house, we became valuable in Alberta. All of a sudden, Amen, and we've got more respect in the church. But when we own no home, we ate soup for a year and a half and saved $10,000, and with no help from no relative or no one, we put a down payment and bought a home. And our value in the church skyrocketed. But it didn't change one iota with God, right? With God, that's not the case. I remember all those things, bless God. But anyhow, maybe I shouldn't talk about stuff like that. But anyhow... <laughs> So Paul's mind is ever-present on a choice against a reoccurring temptation to rely on anything apart from Christ. So obviously this was maybe one of Paul's weaknesses, to rely on something else. So now the tense passes from the perfect tense to the present tense. Knowing Jesus Christ my Lord is not only superior to the privileges of Judaism and religion, Knowing Christ excels and outstrips him to such a degree that it must be considered a class apart. It's like considering an old Ford or an old Chev against a Rolls Royce. Can you compare them in value? No, you can't. Hopefully I haven't said anything wrong here today, but anyhow, bless God. Sometimes I have the habit of doing that, you know. On intentionally 100%. Okay, the expression to know Christ is intimate and glows with warmth of a direct relationship. The expression to know Christ may be taken as equivalent to fellowship with Christ. The intimate relationship with Jesus into which Paul has been brought was secured with a high price. Answering the divine call and revelation of the Lord caused the forfeit or the giving up of everything else that he considered valuable. Paul surrendered his pride and he gave up everything that he once considered valuable. And I did that too at a camp meeting and when I was 27 years old. And, I, and it, for some strange reason, at that camp meeting was a speaker from Thailand named, what was his name, Marcus or? I forget, anyways, and, he, and I ended up going there never dreaming that years later I would go to Thailand. But I, I surrendered my life and I said, God, whatever you want. And I died to all the things that I thought that I was going to do and I took on what God wanted me to do. Sometimes what we desire lines up, sometimes it doesn't. But anyways, Paul died to all those things. For his sake, he says, I have discarded everything else. For the third time, 
Paul uses the same verb, consider or counting, to declare his determination to resolve to be done with his old life. And like my daughter says, Elaine, I'm done with that. That's her favorite thing. I'm done with it. All confidence in the flesh is contemptuously cast aside and considered as garbage. Such is God's estimate of all religious observance and practice which is not rooted in Christ. So anything that's not rooted in Christ is considered as garbage. The goal of Paul's reevaluation is the supreme Christ, Paul's personal possession. You know, and that's what I wanted to know him as a young person. I wanted him to be my personal possession. I wanted to know him intimately, and I spent hours in prayer. And before I'd go to work in the morning, I, starting at about 23 when we bought our first home, we owned it for seven years. But at least we can say we at least owned a home, right, dear? We might not now, but at one time we did. And uh, I would go down in the basement and pray for one and two hours every morning before I went to work. I wanted to know him. And I studied the Strong's Concordance. It was the strangest thing to me, but God, it became very simple after a little while. But I remember in the beginning, it seemed strange. But I wanted to know him, and I wanted to know his power. I wanted to be obedient to whatever that he had for my life. And I, and I realized, say, I was shared about our staff in the first service, that I noticed that they weren't making decisions that were based on the right, on the spirit. You know, I mean, that you can say a lot when you say to your staff, you know, you're making decisions that aren't based on the spirit. Oh, yes, I am. I said, no, they're based on feelings. So I took the three youngest staff with me, and the, three, the last three that were on staff, uh, one is now 29, I think the other one's 28, and the other one's 26 or 27, and I prayed with them for two years now, Monday to Friday, from 6.30 to uh, 8 in the morning, and with about a 15-minute Bible study. We didn't talk about anything else. We didn't discuss anything. We go in there, and we pray. We don't talk, and, uh, and we seek God. And so I asked them this year, after two years of prayer, what did you notice after the first year? They said, after the first year of praying from 6.30 to 8 every morning, we noticed there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. And they said, in the second year, we began to operate in the spirit. And they became more powerful preachers than the other people that had been on staff for a long time. They had... Uh, God began to deal with them. They were surprised. God began to correct them and deal with them. And I guess it wasn't me, but it was the Holy Spirit because they had yielded themselves. Their hearts were right before God. They yielded themselves. And now they have, uh, when they get up to speak, just the anointing's on them. The presence of God is there in a powerful way. Even the young girl who used to be, uh, she's 26 or 7, she was a babysitter. She gra these all graduated from our Bible school. She's a babysitter of our staff children and of our students' children. She wants to be an evangelist now. I say, well, we need you a little bit longer, dear. And uh, she gets up there and preaches. She was a quiet little mouse. She turned into a bold little preacher through that prayer, even though she'd been to Bible school and uh, done her three years and, and had been on staff for about the same. She became bold through that prayer. There was an empowerment that came to her. So Paul... Loses all to gain Christ. The person of Christ and the work of Christ are inseparably joined. Whatever the precise sense of these profound terms, Paul here speaks of all who bear the name Christian. And when we read in, in Philippians chapter 1, he talks about in there to everyone. This is the only book that Paul didn't bring correction in. And he says, this is to everybody that I'm writing to. To all aspects, to every avenue, to every person who calls them named Christian. So this is not just to a special group, whether they're mystics or martyrs or the fivefold ministry. All need to renounce pride and seek Christ alone. Christ alone is the source of their salvation and their foundation in life. And then verse 9 says, and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I have become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. 
Paul's thought now moves to the future day of judgment. Paul has a longing to be one with Christ. To be in Christ or one with Christ is nothing else than having righteousness alone that comes from Christ. And he says, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. First, Paul makes it clear that this righteousness cannot be acquired by human effort. You cannot work for it. Then he says, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Secondly, Paul stresses that it comes to the believer as a gift of God in Christ. And thirdly, the medium or way through which the divine righteousness or God's saving power is put forth is on behalf of God's people is by faith. And we continue to live by faith. And then Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him sharing in his own death. Who here wants to suffer with Jesus? I don't see any takers here. So he says, I want to know Christ. And this knowing Christ is another way of expressing the personal faith union set up between the Christian and our Lord. And I want to experience his mighty power that raised him from the dead. And that mighty power, as it begins to work in us, you can't help but begin to witness and to share Christ with others. It was oceans, was it, that I went to? I went to oceans where east meets west. Where, it's not where boy meets girl, you know. East meets west, right? And I began to witness to the Filipino at the counter all kinds of opportunities. And we discussed there. I think Anna was sweating a little bit. Uh, uh, as we were talking, she wasn't sure what was going to happen next. Is that right? He got a little hostile, but he calmed down. And he began to listen to what I had to say. So Paul is speaking of Jesus Christ, liberated by his victory over death. The power at work in the life of the believer, raising us from the death of sin into the newness of Christ. And examples of this dunamis power is in verses Romans 6 and 4. It says, For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, we also may live new lives. In Ephesians 1.19, I pray also that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe. In Ephesians 2.5, and it says, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. And now I want to look at, he says, I want to suffer with him. And it means to be in the fellowship of his sufferings. And in Acts 9, 15 and 16, Ananias was supposed to go to talk to Paul. And he says, I'm going to show Paul many things that he must suffer for me. And, 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 you know, when we do God's work, yes, we need to be blessed. If we're not blessed, if, you're, if uh, your church here is not blessed, if Pastor Randy is not blessed, then you can't help. You can't go around the world and help other people. We need to be blessed. But then there's also a thing where sometimes it's necessary to suffer. And sometimes my wife is, se- not sometimes, she's separated from the children for 10 months out of the year. And uh, so there's some suffering involved, a willingness to partake, a willingness to have, to go through difficulties in order to fulfill the destiny that God has called you to. Well, you know, Paul was shipwrecked in many other things. I want to suffer with him describes a close affinity and relationship between Jesus' sufferings on the cross and the lot of life that Paul, who in this life that God had given him to live. So the, the life that Paul had was a, it was a very difficult at times. Paul represented Christ so realistically that Paul's apostolic sufferings were regarded as an extension of the dying of Jesus born in his mortal body. You know, when you read about Paul's life, and I tell the students, I say to the students, hey, how would you like to have a life like Paul? No, 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 no. Well, who would like to do great things for God? Oh, they all would, but they don't want to have the shipwreck and other things that sometimes come along with it. He said he was three days and night out at the sea, right? And they said that Paul's personality was if somebody started to complain, they'd probably say, shut up, Timothy, and keep on swimming, right? I don't know if his personality was like that or not, but, but he was a tough fellow. 
2 Corinthians 4.10 says, Through suffering our bodies continue to share in the death, in the death of Jesus, that the death of Jesus may also be seen in our own bodies. And there can be hardly any other meaning of these verses which so dramatically set for the significance which Paul gives to suffering for Christ's sake. And so Paul's suffering is considered an extension of Jesus' suffering. Who here says, I want to suffer with Jesus? Anybody? I don't see one hand. Not one. No, not one. Amen. I haven't voluntarily said that either. But I'm willing in order to fulfill what God has called me to do. And Philippians 3.11 says, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And Paul goes on to make it clear that, total, that the total completion of the work of grace awaits the resurrection from the dead. Here and now, the Christian is risen with Christ and is living in the power of Jesus' victorious life. But the Christian believer still looks forward to and cherishes the prospect of a future consummation and a completion of the perfection of our inner conflict. Who inside of here doesn't have any conflict anymore? Is there anybody here? There's no conflict going on. You just totally yielded. If there isn't any conflict going on, do you know what that means? It means you've joined your relatives. Amen. That have gone on before you. One day we all will, won't we? If Jesus doesn't come back first. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guard your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature desires. And it says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And James 4, 7 says... So humble yourselves, submit yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee. And when we read Romans 6 and Romans 8, it talks about how the power of the devil is broken off of our lives. He no longer has control of our lives. He can't order us around anymore. When we're in God's kingdom, when we've been transferred out of the kingdom of light into the kingdom of darkness, the devil has no authority and no power over any of your lives. You're free from his power. The only thing he can do is lie to you and deceive you. But the question is, who are you going to submit? Are you going to submit to what Jesus has done? Are you going to submit to God, resist the devil, and have him flee? Or are you going to submit to what's that little bit that's left of your old nature and let that take control? But the devil has no authority over any of your life. He can't do anything to you. It's like you're in two fields before you were in a field here, and that was a devil's field. And you were his slave, and he, you operated to his bidding. But when you were born again, you were taken out of that field. There's a road in between, and in this field right here, you're in the field of God. And you're working a way out there. All the devil can do is yell at you. He can call you names, or he can say, come on over here, and let's have, go for a drink. He can only tempt you, but he has no power over any of your lives. You cannot say, the devil made me do it. But you can say, I submitted to the flesh and I did it, right? But you can't say the devil made you do it. So the question is, who are you going to submit to? Are you going to submit to God? Say, here I am, oh God. I submit to you I'm, I'm, and I turn myself over to you. I resist the devil and have him flee. Are you going to submit to your flesh? Paul looked forward to the day, and we look forward to the day when the inner conflict will be resolved in the perfection of the blessed state following the resurrection. When you read about Paul, he hated the weakness of his flesh. He hated his sinful nature, that part that was still left, because we're in bodies that were at Adam and Eve in the garden that were cursed, the ground was cursed, and, and so we still have a little bit of that old self still there. He hated that and longed to be rid of it. Who here longs to be rid of that? Anybody? When we are resurrected from the dead, there will be no more inner conflict. There will be no more sinful nature against the spirit. 
and the spirit against the sinful nature. The sinful nature will be gone forever, just like your relatives who've gone on. There's no more struggle now between the old nature and the new nature. They have the new nature of Christ. They're happy, and they're celebrating with Jesus. They're celebrating with those that went on before them. So what do we learn from this? All right, I learned that I went overtime already. But I'll soon be done. Because of all that Christ had become to Paul, what was once valuable to Paul has now become worthless. Everything is worthless, number two, compared with the infinite value of knowing God. Number three, our mind should be alert to a reoccurring temptation to rely on something other than Christ. Number four, all confidence in the flesh should be cast aside and considered as garbage. Number five, righteousness cannot be acquired by human effort. Number six, the power is at work in the life of the believer, raising him or us from the death of sin into newness in Christ. Now we're gonna look at steps to dynamic devotion. Devotion focuses on the pursuit of intimacy with God. It is devoting oneself to knowing Jesus Christ. One measure of maturity is a degree to which this pursuit becomes our all-consuming focus and desire. And that's what happened to me. It became my focus and desire to be like him. Nowhere is a disciple of Jesus more challenged to become a man or woman after God's own heart than here. And understand that no personal achievement earns spiritual position. Do not be afraid to lose everything in your quest to know Christ. Make knowing Christ your main goal in life. Know that this quest to know Christ always involves self-sacrifice and, and unselfish living. And aim to achieve the goal that God has set for you. What is the goal? that God has for your life? What, do you, what are you called to do before you die? And I heard the saddest thing, and I think it's probably true, is to live and to die and never fulfill the purposes why God had you on this earth. What is the goal? And spare no cost in this quest, seeking him, so that you can fulfill his purposes in your life. Spare no effort in your pressing towards the mark of knowing God. And I get that. People thought I was crazy. You know, when we first, you don't know, but I know, when I first went to Thailand, my mother and father dedicated me to God when I was a baby. There, Anna's mother and father dedicated her to God when she was a baby. And we grew up in a mainline, spirit-filled group. But when it came time to go to Thailand, do you know what they said? Let somebody else do it. You stay here. But I thought you dedicated to me to God as a baby. Go let somebody else do it. No. There's sacrifice involved sometimes when you're going to do the will of God. We don't go and let somebody else do our calling. We do our own purpose. Huh? That was my parents' view. That was Anna's parents' view. Go let somebody else do it. You stay here. And they even had a deacon come and talk to me. I didn't know till five years later my mother had a deacon come. My mother was a godly woman, considered one of the most godly women in the church, and said to me, if you take your children to Thailand... You're going to destroy their lives. He, he drilled water wells, you know, and his name was Wally Waterwell. And after he was done, I called him Wally, Wally, Wally Waterhead. You know, not really, but I'm just kidding. But I thought that because people are saying, don't fulfill God's call. The cost is too high. Is that why? Maybe we haven't reached out and got things done the way we should because the cost is too high to me. So spare no effort in your pressing towards the mark of knowing Christ. Recognize that single-eyed pursuit of God is the hallmark of true spiritual maturity. And know that those who offer cheap alternatives to knowing Christ become his enemies. So whenever you try to do everything the shortcut way, you end up short-circuiting everything, and you, you can become an enemy of God. So we have to do it God's way. And be willing and know that he will bless us. He will provide everything that we need. But sometimes sacrifice is involved in order to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. I don't mean to get too intense. I'm sorry. 
But uh, so are we going to do what God's called us to do? Are we going to fulfill his purpose even though it may involve sacrifice for you personally? So we go back to the beginning. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Jesus has done. Amen. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Pastor. Oops. Did you hear God speaking to you today? Did you hear how he's challenging us? Thank you, Marvin. Challenging us that it's time to evaluate. Are we really serious about serving God or are we not? Doesn't matter what your age is, whether you're a young person or whether you're approaching the end of your days, God still has work for you to do or your breath would be gone. As long as we breathe, God has a plan for us to fulfill. I'd like you to bow your heads with me for a moment. And I want to talk to God, and I want you to talk to God yourself also. Father, we ask you to examine our hearts. You've been speaking to us through your word, through the Apostle Paul, through Marvin as well, helping us to understand that there's a price to pay to serve Jesus. There's a, there's a price to pay to do things God's way. Sometimes that price is difficult for us to pay. But Lord, you are bigger than all of those things. So Lord, we don't back away from the call of God on our lives. But instead, we embrace the words from heaven that have spoken to our lives. Friend, God wants you to follow Jesus with all of your heart. Whether you're watching over the internet or here in this place, the call of God is to surrender fully to Him. Not to hold anything back, but to live for God with all of your heart. And as you do that, you'll receive the help that you need. You'll receive the, the joy that you desire. You'll, you'll fulfill things for God. You'll see him use you. So I want to pray for you. I feel there may be one or two here that have not made peace with God. You, you're still living for yourself. You've never come to a point, a place of decision where you said, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Perhaps you're still trying to live and be the boss of your own life. And God said, I didn't design you to be the ruler over your own life. I designed you to follow me. God knows the way he made you. He knows what he's made you for. Only by following him can you have true satisfaction and please him in every area of life. Is there anyone here today that would say, Pastor, I know my life is not pleasing God. I know I've decided I, I've, I'm living my own way. I want to serve God, but I'm living it my way. I, I want to please God every day, but I'm trying to do it my own way. And today I'm ready to surrender to God. If that's you, put your hand up. I want to pray for you. In fact, I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender. Is there anyone here today? Say, Pastor, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I don't want to just live for myself. I truly want to surrender to him. Can I lead us to pray right out loud? Say, Heavenly Father. Right out loud, say, Heavenly Father. I ask you to speak clearly into my life. Help me to see what I'm doing right. Help me to see what I'm doing wrong. I open my heart to you. Holy Spirit, examine me. Just like David, if there's any wicked way in me, Reveal it to me so that I can turn quickly from it. I want to please you at every juncture of life. In Jesus' name, we surrender to him. Look up at me for a moment. I've watched 
Marvin and Anna from a distance for almost 20 years now. We were being close sometimes, but not close all the times because we're far apart in distance. But I've seen them through very challenging times that did not lo lose focus on what Jesus said do. You've kept your course straight, even in challenging times. Well done. We've had the privilege to walk along through some of those moments together as well. The work they're doing in Thailand is really astounding compared to what others are doing. There's such a small number of believers there. But the ones that are coming, they're shaping them into the image of Jesus where they are bold in their faith, which is not a cultural norm where they stand up for Jesus in the marketplace, will preach in a market where others are around. That's not normal. Where they'll go on assignment to, to a church and they'll give their all to build the ministry of somebody else because it lifts up the name of Jesus. Friends, this is good ground to invest in financially. They do have financial needs. If they talk about a new vehicle, we think, wow, that is great. But they took of personal resources that came that they didn't have to invest in ministry to take care of a need that wasn't covered by others. So I want to challenge you today to give financially towards Marvin and Anna and the good work that they're doing in Thailand. And I'd ask that everyone is given the opportunity to have an offering envelope. I use mine. I'll take another one, please. But I want you to, to give today and to invest in what God is doing in a nation, thank you, that desperately needs Jesus. We'll hear more about Thailand on the news because uh, many things will go on there over the years. But I want, you to, uh, I want you to join with me and invest financially in what's happening there. Well, I've already given today. Well, thank you. We've all had opportunity to give. And so I'm not twisting any arms. I'm giving you an opportunity to sow into what God is already sowing into. When you join forces with God, you win. Is that true? When we join forces with God, we win. And so if you didn't come prepared to give in this offering today, uh, you can take an offering envelope home and just make sure you mark it appropriately so that we know it's going to Thailand. If you want to mail it back to us, the debit machines will be open in just a couple of minutes out in the foyer as well if you want to give that way. But let's do our best to invest in what God is already investing in lives in a place where Jesus is not lifted up enough. But we plan to do something about it together. Amen? Is it all right that we can sow in fields around the world? This is the heart of God. Jesus did not come for the people of Israel. He came for all people. Even though he spent his life in one nation, he poured out his life for all nations. And so we want to invest in what God is doing elsewhere. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for doing your best. If God speaks to you, you can always designate toward Thailand and we will ensure that it goes towards their ministry that God is doing through them in Thailand. Marvin is not just a hard taskmaster to his students. He is strict with them, but he is a father to them. When they hurt, he hurts. When they need a rebuke, he helps them with it. But often, as parents, you would know, when you rebuke a child, it hurts you as well. And so he has the heart of a father. Let's lift our offering envelopes up to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving today, of investing in good ground, in a nation called Thailand, into people that you've chosen to make a difference in their lives, to change their 
personalities so they have the personality of Jesus Christ. To change their desires so they desire to see their fellow Thai people, their fellow native people. Follow Jesus with all of their heart. Lord, enrich them through this offering today, we pray. Help Marvin and Anna to continue the good work that they're doing, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You're still watching over the internet and you want to give. You can just go to the top of the toolbar where it says donate. And you can donate. There's a field there where you can say what it's towards. Just say it's towards Thailand. Uh, Cliff, could you take my offering envelope as well, please? And we'll ensure that 100% of it goes towards Thailand. You'll get a receipt back very quickly, even by email. And so you'll know that it's gone to a charity that uh, has integrity to serve God. Those of you here for the first time and the rest of us, let's pull out our connection card for just a moment. I'm sorry if I went too fast and some of you weren't prepared. The ushers will wait for you. Look at the back of the connection card, would you please, just for a moment. I trust you've finished the front part, but we'll collect these at the door on the way out. There's next steps today to take. First one is to put into your heart in memory, Philippians 3, 7. And then to make a decision, to say it, to, to declare that knowing Christ is my highest priority. Not your friend, but Jesus, your friend. And then that you'll be alert to recurring temptations. What happens when you see that temptation rising up again and again? God wants to deal with it. He wants to take it away from you. Surrender it to Him. Next week we'll be studying in the book of Acts chapter 5. I encourage you to read through it. And then you can send us comments on Facebook or our Twitter page and, and get back to us back and forth. And let's get a dialogue going. If you have questions, you can send it. And I, I believe that if you get them in early enough, we'll actually answer some of those questions. And then guess what? This week, we have Heroes Camp beginning on Saturday right here. It, what what is, is our sanctuary now will be a gymnasium. And there'll be students coming from all around Brampton. And Coach Magley from the Brampton A's will be here and some others. Some of, our, some of our young men will be here. Maybe even some of our young women will be here to help out. If you want to help out, help young men uh, particularly, but some, lady, some young girls may come as well to gather some basketball skills in a Christian environment where they actually are prayed for, where they develop relationships with God's people. Then I encourage you to come out Saturday, but come out first on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, our, our, our team that's making Heroes Camp happen will meet here in the sanctuary 7 p.m. on uh, Wednesday night. So come out for that if you could, please. And you'll notice on the back, if you plan on being part of the 55 and plus Pastor Reed's fitness class. No, it's not his. Just check that off. And then we'd like to have some teams made up for for our chair removal. Each week, this week, we'll have three different nights when this area is used to help others in the community gain some skills and also get some input from godly people. And so we're using our building, not just Sunday morning, but we use it for sports. And so we want to get some teams together so it doesn't just rely on, on a small group of people to tear down the chairs and the stage on Sunday. So if you would like to do that the first Sunday of the month, the second, the third, the fourth, just mark down which one you want to do, please. And until we get our teams in place, I'd like to encourage all the men to stay behind for just about 15 minutes. Stack the chairs up and, and help us move them out so that we can enjoy the place God has given us. Does that sound like a good idea? It's good that somebody else does it, right? Guess what? Somebody else can be you too. We don't let the ladies lift the chairs. They're too heavy for them. We get the men to lift the ones, low ones. And then as they get stronger, they can lift them higher. Amen. Well, if you want one of the prayer cloths, they'll be up at the front. Uh, and so you can collect one of those to take home with you. Let's stand together. First timers, there is our welcome center over the side. Please spend a couple minutes with us. 
while others are busy. If you're registering for the activities out in the foyer, please come and, and, and take care of that, ladies, while your men are helping us uh, pile some chairs. There's some pictures that you'll want to see from Thailand there as well, out in the entranceway. So when I finish praying, you go out there and check it all out. Father, we pray your blessing on each and every one of your people today. But not just today, throughout this week, strengthen them. Bless them as they're about your business and their business. And Lord, even those watching over the internet, keep them safe and healthy, holy and in the center of your will, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. If you want one of the prayer claws, please get one off of Indra. Thank you so much. Yeah.